Welcome to the second video in my bread science series. This one I am going into the bread making process, specifically for a simple yeasted dough, which includes flour, water, yeast, and salt, as mentioned in the previous video, as well as the addition of milk and butter and sugar. So I hope you enjoy it. I wanted to start this video off by making some amendments to my previous video, and so I'll be doing that before I get into the bread making process. The first amendment is just a little bit more information on gluten. Um, so the two proteins that make up gluten, which are glutenin and gliadin, uh, they have different properties that influence the gluten as they form. Glutenin helps provide the strength and elasticity to the uh, gluten network, and gliadin helps provide the stretchiness. So each of these proteins is contributing sort of a different aspect to the gluten network. So in the last video, I mainly talked about doughs that were made from just flour, water, yeast, and salt as the basic ingredients for a yeasted dough that rises. And that would essentially make up what we would call an unenriched or a lean dough. Um, and these unenriched doughs can have a little bit of fat, but usually just a very minimal amount to, in order to qualify as a lean dough. On the contrary, we can have an enriched dough, which is those same four ingredients. Sometimes people will replace the water with just milk, and usually they'll add um, quite a bit of fat and or sugar. That fat can be in the form of lots of oil or uh, butter or egg yolks or eggs in general, and the sugar can be simple table sugar, for example. And so on the bottom here, on the uh, right-hand side, we have two enriched doughs. On the top, we have hala, and on the bottom, we have brioche. The hala is usually enriched with some sort of oil, as well as eggs and sugar. And the brioche on the bottom usually has a, a quite substantial amount of butter, as well as uh, eggs and sugar as well. And as you can see, these doughs are quite yellow from all that um, nice yellow fats that they contain. And then on the right hand side, we have two unenriched doughs. On the top, we have a, a basic white sourdough that wasn't fermented for very long. And then also on the bottom, we have a uh, sourdough baguette, which also wasn't fermented for very long. So they're quite pale, and they both only included that basic flour, water, salt, and yeast. And so in comparison, you can see sort of differences in color. And this will also yield a difference in texture and flavor, um, as well as gluten development in these doughs. To continue on the discussion of enriched versus unenriched doughs, or lean doughs, um, the fat and the sugar that you add to an enriched dough, which you can see in the, the pictures on the left-hand side, this is the challah and the brioche from the previous slide, and on the left-hand side we have the unenriched doughs. But anyway, uh, the fats and the sugars that you add to the enriched doughs can actually interfere with the gluten development and help to tenderize the bread. The reason that sugar can interfere with the gluten development is because sugar actually attracts water, meaning that it is hydrophilic. So because it attracts water, it actually competes with gluten for water. So if you add a sugar to the dough, um, the, it will attract some of the water that could otherwise be used to help bind the glutenin and the gliadin into gluten. The way that fat influences gluten development is a little bit different because unlike sugar, fat actually repels water, meaning that it is hydrophobic. And so if you consider an example like a, a um, buttermilk biscuit dough or a pie crust, one of the first steps that you do is you actually cut or blend the butter into the flour or the fat into the flour, for example. And what this is doing is that when you're when you're blending the butter or the fat into the flour, that fat is coating the flour particles, which then when you add the liquid at a later stage, because the flour particles are coated with, with this water repelling fat, it can prevent the water from entering and coating the flour and prevent gluten formation because it prevents that glutenin and gliadin from forming gluten. In addition to that, the fat can also bind to the gluten that does form, which can actually make it more difficult for the um, gluten to form into longer strains. So therefore, if you do mix the fat into the flour before you hydrate the dough, then you can actually get a more cake-like bread. As opposed to a different circumstance, and this is often something that you do with brioche, um, with brioche you usually knead the dough and formulate the dough without adding the butter until after you've kneaded the dough. And what that does is that because the gluten structure is already formed in the dough, when you go to mix the butter in later, the fat doesn't quite disrupt the gluten structure as much as it would if you added the, the fat when you're mixing the flour together. <laughs> 
So to summarize, essentially sugar and fat can reduce gluten formation and shorten gluten strands, therefore giving a softer and more tender bread. And this bread also tends to have more flavor than an unenriched dough, as you can see in the figures on the lower right hand side. Those are unenriched doughs. But honestly, both the enriched doughs and unenriched doughs are both delicious. Bread is just good pretty much no matter what, so I honestly suggest you try any kind of bread if you can. I also wanted to discuss whole grain flour a little bit more in detail. Um, I didn't mention in the last video, but whole grain flour actually tends to contain the most gluten relative to other wheat flours. Um, however, because it has bits of bran and germ pieces, which are quite fibrous, they can actually break up and disturb the gluten strands, which can interfere with gluten development, which is why um, the structure of a whole, uh, whole wheat bread can actually be a little bit more dense relative to one made from regular all-purpose or bread flour. Um, and I did mention in the last video that there are quite a few more nutrients and vitamins and things in whole grain flour as opposed to AP flour or white flour. But it is important to note that not all these nutrients and vitamins are actually digestible. Um, sometimes they can just pass right through your system without being broken down. So not all these nutrients are extracted. So they aren't, so whole grain flours aren't necessarily more healthy in the sense that you get everything out of the grain. But these whole wheat flours, I would argue, are still relatively more nutritious because they have more fiber, which is good for your digestion. And it, there's a good chance that at least some of those nutrients that they have relative to a white flour will be digested. And in cases where you use uh, long fermentation or sourdough, it can actually help uh, break up those vitamins and minerals a little bit. Or it has acids within sourdough that can help uh, make those vitamins and minerals um, more extractable. The final amendment I wanted to make to the previous video is I wanted to discuss starch in a little bit more detail. Uh, when flour is milled, it can destroy some, but not necessarily all, starch granules. So as you can see in the figure on the right-hand side, we have in intact starch granules that are formed within a dough. Um, I say that the dough is formed because as you can see, there is gluten strands, so this dough has already um, had some development going on. And then on the more right-hand side of that figure, we have damaged starch granules. And damaged starch granules are quite important in the bread making process because it's actually these granules and not usually the intact granules that the enzymes act on. So these enzymes are acting on the damaged starch granules because usually the molecules of starch within them are more accessible. Um, in addition to that, these damaged uh, starch granules can also absorb water easier, which helps with hydration of the dough. However, damaged starch granules aren't the only important part of uh, starch that is important in the bread making process because intact starch granules, even though they're less susceptible to enzyme activity and less likely to absorb water at room temperature, intact starch granules are still very important for the bread making process, in particular the bread baking process, and I'll be going into that in quite a bit more detail later in this video. Now that I'm finished discussing the amendments, I will be getting into the details of the bread making process. And for the sake of this video, I'll be focusing on a commercial yeast bread, uh, what would be typically called like a white bread or a sandwich bread in the United States or Canada. Um, mainly, it's usually made with just AP flour or bread flour and with commercial yeast. And so therefore it, it has a very short fermentation time of about two or two and a half hours. And I'll be talking about each of these nine steps below in various uh, levels of detail. We begin the bread making process with mixing the dough together and in pictures one through seven I'll be discussing the steps that are involved in this particular dough but um, any bread that you make might have different steps, different processes, different um, ingredients and so this is just to serve as an example. In picture one um, I show that I'm activating the yeast because I was using active dry yeast, I had to mix that yeast in with some warm water and some sugar in order to make sure that it was still alive and to sort of get it started on fermentation before all the other ingredients were added. And then in picture two, I added some of the flour, but not all of the flour, as well as the rest of the sugar, the salt, and also the butter. And then in picture three, you can see that, that those ingredients have been mixed together and you have a relatively dry but firm dough, but not all the ingredients have been added yet. In picture four, I add in the milk. As mentioned, this is a slightly enriched dough, so I use milk, not just water. And then in picture five, that milk has been mixed in, and we have kind of this, this loose, uh, almost pancake battery type mixture going on, and that's because not all the flour has been added yet. So then in picture six, we add 
all the rest of the flower and then we start mixing that together and we get to picture number seven where we have this really really shaggy dough and it's just about ready to be kneaded which I will discuss in the next slide. But some important things I wanted to point out in terms of this mixing process is that the reason why we're adding the milk and, and flour and um, water at different stages is because we want to sort of slowly hydrate the flour um, in order to and also in order to mix all the ingredients in um, as much as possible before we start the kneading process. And also with this bread, uh, the reason why some milk and butter is used and sugar is not only because it helps sort of tenderize the gluten as I discussed in a previous slide, but also because it really makes the bread more flavorful, a little bit more tasty. Um, and as mentioned later, it also can help slow down staling as well. Continuing on from picture number seven in the previous slide, here we have the dough that's been dumped onto a, a clean work surface and we are starting the bread kneading process, which is critical in, in bread formation in this particular dough. Um, so as we're kneading the bread, we're not only developing the gluten by stretching and pulling it and sort of helping to align the gluten network, but the process of kneading, as you can see, the dry flour that's on the left uh, picture helps get incorporated into this nice smooth dough, meaning that we're allowing the, the water to hydrate and allowing more of that gluten to form. Also, the, the salt is being dispersed more evenly during the kneading process, so both the water and the salt are helping to form the gluten network, and the process of you physically kneading it is also helping to form the gluten network. The first fermentation for a quick yeasted dough usually takes about one hour. The reason why it's so fast is because we're using an active dry yeast, which contains the enzyme zymase, which can act on the table sugar that we were looking at earlier that we added to the dough. And so that's why this fermentation happens so quickly, because zymase can help break down the table sugar, which is sucrose, into glucose and fructose, and that glucose can quickly be used for fermentation. So it's all, all very fast in this case. Um, some people call rising or fermentation uh, proving or proofing. Another thing that is very important that's happening during this first fermentation or rise is that the gluten is hydrating and it's also relaxing, which allows it to stretch and expand because it has elasticity, which is very important because as that fast fermentation is going on, if the dough wasn't stretchy and elastic, then it would really hinder um, this, the sort of gas expansion and the expansion of the dough overall. After the first fermentation, a very common process after you take the dough out of the bowl, which is what you can see in the top right hand image here, um, a very common process after you take the dough out of the bowl is to punch it down or to degas it. And this is actually a surprisingly important step in making a yeasted bread because it does a few things. One thing is that it, it pushes out CO2, which if there's excess CO2 in the dough, it can actually start to inhibit the yeast. In addition to that, the punching down also helps to redistribute the yeast and the enzymes which is important because if they're running out of substrates and they're being moved to a different location in the dough with more substrates, then they can continue the fermentation process. Another thing that punching down and shaping helps with is that, is that it can help equilibrate the temperature of the dough. For example, if the dough is cold in one area and warm in another, if the temperature is equilibrated, then it can help with sort of consistent fermentation. The shaping process not only helps with also redistributing the yeast and enzymes, but it but it also is really important for aligning and strengthening the gluten network um, into a more ordered structure. Usually when you're shaping a loaf, you wanna make sure that it has quite a nice tight surface area so that as it rises and expands during the second fermentation and during the baking, it can sort of expand into a nice ordered structure and a nice tight loaf with a really good, um, a really nice round top, which is what we're looking for. We've punched down the dough, we've shaped the dough, and now we are ready for the second rise or second fermentation or the last proofing stage, depending on what word you prefer. And the figures here, or the pictures here, on the left-hand side, we have the dough before it was uh, went through the second fermentation, and it only fills up about half of the pan. And then as you can see on the right-hand side, this is the dough after fermentation, right before baking, and it's over doubled in size, so it's filled with the pan, it's it's rounded nice and and round on the top from having shaped it into a nice round loaf with a tight surface area in the previous step. And there are some important things that happen during the second fermentation. Not only does the dough ferment again, which helps to develop flavor and structure in the bread, but also the gluten relaxes during this process, which helps it expand in order to ferment again, 
And also when the gluten is relaxed, it helps it to expand even further when it starts to bake. It may seem like I went through the bread making process very, very quickly because we're already at the baking stage, but there's actually a lot, a lot of things that go on during the baking stage, and I'm going to get into quite a few of those details um, in, the, in the following slides. And as you can see here on the left, or sorry, the right hand side, we have that same loaf after it's been fully baked and I've brushed it with butter to make it nice and shiny and glossy. And it's risen quite well, it baked quite well into this beautifully structured bread. But we have to think about all the various things that are happening during the baking process. For example, we have a certain temperature at which the enzyme and the yeast activity stop occurring because the yeast die. In addition to that, we also have the gas bubbles that are trapped within the gluten structure and the starch structure that starts to form. And we also have the water that starts to vaporize and also move throughout the bread, which causes various uh, sort of reactions and processes to occur. We also have the gluten that solidifies into the bread structure, starch gelatinization and also retrogradation, and also the Maillard reaction. So this seems like a lot of different words and I'm going to go through each of these things individually in the following slides. So I'll be going through the baking process at different important temperature points. The first important temperature point is at about 115 degrees Fahrenheit or 46 degrees Celsius. So what's important about this temperature point is that the yeast and the enzymes are actually still active. So the yeast are still performing fermentation because they don't usually die until they reach about 130 or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And the enzymes are also still active until they reach that temperature limit where they start to denature. So we still have just a little bit of residual sort of glucose and starch breakdown up into the point where these yeast and enzymes reach their temperature limit. And so we have the CO2 that's produced from fermentation as well as ethanol that's producing um, different gases that as it's breaking down during uh, baking as well as water that's evaporating during baking. And all of those can sort of form little pockets of air or, or gas in the bread and those bu bubbles of air can be trapped by the gluten and the crust as it forms. And so as you can see in the pictures in the bottom, these loaves of bread are baking and they, they rise up to a certain point because there's still a little bit of fermentation going on and those gas bubbles are expanding and then it stops as the crust starts to form and it starts to dry out and you start to get a loaf of bread that's super light and fluffy on the inside and crispy and crusty on the outside. Once we get to 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius, all of the yeast are dead at this point and the enzymes are mostly denatured. So we have no fermentation going on and almost no uh, starch or sugar breakdown going on anymore. But another important process that starts to occur at these temperatures is the process of starch gelatinization. So remember when I compared the intact uh, starch granules earlier to the damaged starch granules and I said that the intact starch granules would be very important for the bread making process. Well, this is where they start to become very important um, is during the baking process. So the process of starch gelatinization usually begins with the gluten uh, proteins starting to cook and heat up and they release water in that process and that released water can be absorbed by starch granules and they're more likely to absorb that water when they are under heated conditions. And if they absorb too much water, which is usually the case, then they can swell up to a point where they actually explode, kind of like a water balloon that's been filled up with way too much water. And when they do explode, they release the internal starch molecules within them, which are amylose and amylopectin. I'll be describing those in more detail in a little bit here. And so uh, when they explode, they're releasing those gelled starch molecules and those gelled starch molecules can start to firm up and when they firm up, they actually start to help form the bread structure along with the gluten. So overall, this starch gelatinization process is actually quite important. So as mentioned, at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the intact starch granules begin to gelatinize. But I haven't really discussed what a starch granule is, so I'm going to go into that a little bit. And usually a starch granule contains two major starch molecules or polymers, which are these polymers of glucose. Um, so essentially they're glucose superstructures which form these two important starch molecules. These molecules being amylose, which is a lightly branched polymer with a small number of chains. So it's usually very linear, amylose is very linear, as opposed to amylopectin which tends to be more branched and have less linear components to it. So it usually has many clusters of short chains that are connected to it. And in this figure on the right hand side, we have an intact starch granule, which is in its crystalline form. 
And in the middle, this blue represents a lot of amylose that's formed in the core of this granule. And then on the outside, we have semi-crystalline concentric circle of mostly amylopectin that branches out from this core. So you have this structural crystalline starch granule that's very important for the gelatinization process. So the process of gelatinization essentially greatly disturbs or destroys that crystalline starch granule that I discussed in the last slide. And you can follow this figure on the left-hand side to see the process of gelatinization. So we start with this raw um, crystalline starch granule, and as the dough starts to heat up, um, the gluten starts to cook, and as the gluten starts to cook, it releases water, and the starch granules can start to absorb that water. So with heat and with additional water, more water is likely to enter these starch granules, which starts to, to break up their structure because it's breaking up the hydrogen bonds that hold the amylose molecules together and the hydrogen bonds that help hold the amylopectin molecules together. And because they're breaking up the hydrogen bonds, the water then replaces those hydrogen bonds, which doesn't keep these molecules bound together. Instead, it causes them to sort of expand and grow further apart. And when they grow further apart to a certain point, and when the, when the temperature gets to be to a certain point, then it can actually cause the, the starch granule to release mostly amylose and sort of explode. And the amylose and the amylopectin that are released from the starch granules are hydrated. And that causes them to release as this sort of gel-like paste, which as the bread continues to cook, starts to firm up and can help form the bread structure. So once we reach 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 74 degrees Celsius, the amylase is actually still active up to this point. Um, so up until 165 degrees Fahrenheit, it's actually still converting some starch to sugar, which helps develop flavor. So gluten, like any other protein, of course, is going to be cooking and solidifying at these temperatures. Um, but in particular, it's forming a semi-rigid structure. So it's still strong, it's still soft, and it's still, but it's still strong enough in order to hold those air bubbles, which you can see in the two figures on the bottom. An important temperature point after 165 degrees Fahrenheit is 284 degrees Fahrenheit, or 104 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature, typically, that the Maillard reaction begins occurring. We can essentially summarize the Maillard reaction as the browning reaction, what makes bread a nice golden brown color, as you can see in the loaf, loaf on the right-hand side here. So what's happening in the Maillard reaction is that we have residual sugars from fermentation and enzymatic breakdown, as well as amino acids that are the result of enzymatic breakdown, and they are participating in reactions that help to create a brown and flavorful crust. So let's talk a little bit more about the Maillard reaction. Not to crazy amount of detail, but just to more detail. We have three major participants that occur in this reaction, including sugars and amino acids. Those sugars can be subdivided into monosaccharides, such as glucose and fructose, which can be left over from enzymatic breakdown and fermentation, as well as disaccharides like lactose, which can come from milk products like butter or milk, and maltose, which can be a byproduct of the enzymatic activity that I discussed in the previous presentation. And then we also have amino acids, which, which originate from the breakdown of proteins and can be generated by things like proteases, which I also discussed in the previous presentation. So we have that reaction occurring between the sugars and the proteins, which I won't go into great detail about because it's quite complicated. But we can subdivide the Maillard reaction into good browning versus bad browning or burning. Good browning is when we have the generation of these polymers called uh, melanoidins, which are light yellow to dark brown color, as well as the generation of flavor and aroma compounds, which just makes a very flavorful, nice golden brown crust. If you can see on the figures on, or the pictures on the right hand side, we have a sourdough before it was baked on the top and a sourdough after it was baked. And the really nice golden brown locations are what we would consider good browning. But converse to that, and you can see some parts that are quite dark and almost burnt, we have bad browning or burning. Um, if, you, if, the cart, if the crust starts to get too dark or even black, then it's usually a sign that it's gone overboard on the Maillard reaction. And this can be bad because when you burn bread and when you eat burnt bread, um, you could be consuming uh, mutagenic or carcinogenic compounds such as acrylamide, which are not safe to eat. So essentially you want to get bread uh, brown to a degree in which it's flavorful and delicious and a nice color, but not so brown that it's burnt and, and potentially bad for your health.
There's also a lot of factors that influence browning, similar to how there's factors that influence gluten development and starch breakdown and fermentation. We have uh, time and temperature, for example. Um, the longer that you bake your bread and the temperature at which you bake it um, can really influence the degree of browning that you get. For example, if you use a high temperature, you're more, more likely to get a more intense browning that occurs. We also have the influence of pH. Um, browning actually tends to occur best under alkaline conditions. So pH 6 to 8 is usually when browning occurs best. Um, we also have sugar that influences browning. Um, as, as if you've ever made caramel before, that's essentially the caramelization of sugar is what creates a nice deep rich brown caramel that's very delicious, but that's just me getting off track. So the sugar type and amount that you add to your dough can really contribute and influence the browning. Usually if you have more sugar, you're going to get a deeper brown much quicker than if you have a dough that has next to no sugar. Uh, fat also influences the browning. For example, if you bake something with milk solids, such as milk or butter, those milk solids tend to brown. Um, if you've ever made brown butter, that's an example of this, uh, which helps you to develop a darker crust. In, a, in addition to that, other fats such as um, egg yolks, some people brush their egg their some people brush their dough with an egg wash before baking, which really, really helps create a deep golden brown color. So that's another way that fat can influence the browning of your bread. And then we also have the degree of enzyme activity um, and fermentation. For example, the longer that you rest your bread and the longer that you ferment it, the more the sugars can be broken down into the, those monosaccharides, for example, that can help with that browning process. But if you don't let your, your um, if you don't let your starches, for example, break down for very long, then you can get a very pale, um, unattractive looking bread. So essentially all these things can influence browning in various ways. Your bread is finished baking. You have a beautiful golden crust. You have little air bubbles that are trapped by the nice gluten network that you spent so much time developing, and it is just gorgeous. Um, an important thing to note, though, is that if you, unless you plan to eat your bread right away, um, and that means the entire loaf essentially, you shouldn't cut into it too early because not only does this release moisture, but the bread structure is kind of compromised because the, the gelatinized starches, which I mentioned earlier, haven't finished cooling down and setting up. Basically, as soon as you take the bread out of the oven, it's the, the gelled starches start to recrystallize. Um, and start this process of retrogradation, which I'll be discussing more in depth in the next slide. So, as soon as you take the bread out of the oven, it starts to try to reform a crystalline structure, also known as the process of starch retrogradation. Um, and this is also associated with bread staling and hardening over time. So what is starch retrogradation? Well, it's essentially an attempt by amylose and amylopectin, which were gelatinized and, and totally disrupted during the baking process. It's an attempt for them to sort of try to reform their original firm crystalline structure and to recrystallize into their original crystalline form. But it just, it just, they can't crystallize the same way that they were in that original intact starch granule. As you can see, the figures in A, which is that intact starch granule, and C, after retrogradation, they're just, they're just not the same crystalline structure. They're just not the same. I kind of like to think of it as sort of an old band from the 1970s trying to get back together today and play the same music and sound the same, but they're just, they're just not the same. The whole process of gelatinization disrupts the starch granule structure so much that they just can't recrystallize in the same way. So how does this process actually occur? How does this recrystallization actually occur? Well, you have the amylose that usually tends to recrystallize first, and what's happening is that its linear components are starting to realign, and it's starting to, as it cools down, expel the water that it absorbed during the gelatinization process. And because it's expelling that water, then it can reform those original hydrogen bonds and reform a structure. But because it's expelling water, that water can then evaporate, which can contribute to the staling of the bread and cause it to go dry and affects the texture of the bread. And the same process where the water is expelled and hydrogen bonds are reformed and the bread is trying to recrystallize also happens with amylopectin, but usually at a slower and longer rate than with the amylose.
Oh, and, and um, just to clarify, the process of water being released during that starch retrogradation is known as uh, cinericis, and I might be pronouncing that wrong, but hopefully, hopefully it's correct. And just to clarify, um, when I said that the starch is starting to retrograde as soon as it's taken out of the oven, we do like some degree of retrogradation. We want it to firm up to the point where we can easily cut through it and it has a good structure because if you cut into it too early, then the structure can be a little mushy and not so pleasant. But we don't like it when it's so retrograded, so when it's gone through so much retrogradation that it starts to become stale. So, um, I have received some questions about staling, such as can you prevent it or can you slow it down? And as for preventing it, you cannot prevent staling. Um, the, the starches are going to go through the retrogradation or staling process um, inevitably, so it just, it just can't be stopped. However, it can be slowed down to some degree. For example, you should really avoid uh, storing your bread at the temperature of most refrigerators because the temperatures of minus eight to eight degrees Celsius actually greatly enhance the retrogradation process. So it's better to either keep your bread at room temperature or to freeze it um, not long after it's been baked so that you can sort of maintain freshness and you can always reheat it and use it at a different time. Uh, other things that can help slow down uh, staling include adding fat and salt and sugar to the dough because lipids and sugar also help to absorb moisture during baking, which uh, can affect the gel gelatinization and recrystallization process. And the fact that if you're adding sugar and lipids to the bread and it's cooling down and starting to recrystallize um, and releasing water, then those, those sugars and fats can also help absorb that water that's released as the bread is recrystallizing and going through retrogradation. So overall, fat and sugar can help slow down um, the process of staling. Um, and also help enhance the bread softness and taste um, as it's been sitting out for a while. Salt, at, at least at levels that are 2% or less, can also affect the gelatinization process and slow down retrogradation as long as the bread is stored between 4 and 25 degrees Celsius. And then another question is, can you reverse uh, staling? And you kind of can in a way. Um, you can reverse it temporarily by reheating the bread up. Um, when you heat the bread back up, it can soften the crystal structure and it can also help the bread to reabsorb some moisture, um, a bit like a sponge, which makes it taste a little bit less stale and helps it become moist again. Um, but it, this, this whole process of reheating it doesn't work for bread that's overly stale and overly dry. Um, that usually doesn't soften the bread, usually it just dries it out even further. There's a few different routes that you can take with stale bread. You can dry it out further if you want to make toast or croutons or breadcrumbs. And you can use them to top things like macaroni and cheese or add to salads and do various, various things with. Toasted bread is quite delicious. Um, you can also make things such as grilled cheese or French toast, which involves rehydrating and frying the bread. And it's very, very delicious, of course. You can also add the bread to things like bread pudding, where you mix it with a custard and bake it. And it's also delicious. Um, and even in some cases, you can actually ferment it. Um, there's this, this drink that's popular in some parts of uh, Eastern Europe, like uh, called kvass, where they actually include fermented bread. And there actually are also some bread recipes that include bread in their recipe, like that you add bread as an ingredient while you're making bread. So there's really just a world of possibilities for things to do with stale bread. So you shouldn't cry over stale bread. You should use it for something else that's also delicious. Now to conclude this presentation, I would like to summarize the main points. As mentioned earlier, I discussed the difference between lean versus enriched doughs and how the addition of sugar and fats um, can really affect the gluten structure and the texture and the flavor, as well as the staling process of the bread as well. Another main point is that time and patience are quite important for gluten development and the bread making process, as well as gluten relaxation and enzyme activity and fermentation and flavor. A lot of these factors were discussed in more detail in the previous presentation, so I would suggest you look to those if you haven't already watched that presentation. And then as mentioned too, gluten and starch hydration and cooking and solidification are very important in forming the bread structure during the baking process. And I discussed quite in depth about the starch gelatinization retrogradation processes and their roles in building the bread structure and also staling of the bread.
And just to summarize, starch gelatinization is when the crystalline starch granule starts to explode and expel this gel-like substance, which can then firm up and form the red structure. And then the process of retrogradation is those exploded gel uh, structures or exploded gel um, substances starting to try to reform a crystalline structure, which isn't quite perfect, but does its best anyway, and that contributes to the staling of the bread. And so, in conclusion, I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I hope you will stick around for a sourdough introduction, which will be my next bread science video, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and see you later.